May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be accepted in my sight, my Lord and Redeemer, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Well, today I thought we might take a very special lesson out of the Gospel. And normally I kind of do different things, but today that's such an important message that we received this morning. A witness to the Lamb of God. A witness to the Lamb of God. We're told by John the Baptist that he bears witness to Christ by proclaiming these words in John 1.29. Here is the Lamb of God who takest away the sin of the world. The Father is quite correct. The world, not just Christians. You have to become a Christian, though, to receive that. Like John the Baptist today, we may wish to become a witness of the Lamb of God. How do we become a witness? We know we're Christian, and we know we can share that with other people. Well, Christ as the Lamb of God is a familiar title to us, isn't it? He is the Lamb of God. In the Eucharist, at the breaking of the bread, if you pay close attention to the liturgy, at the fraction, in the fraction anthem, we proclaim what the Baptist said in word and in song. Our traditional fraction of anthem is the Agnes Day, isn't it? O Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, and then grant us thy peace. Book of Common Prayer. These words are more than something said or sung, though. In these words we express, if we carefully think about them, don't just sing them, or don't just say them, it contains the basis for all of our faith and belief. It is the kernel of truth that surfaces to the top so that we can see and understand what's below and maybe a little bit more complex for us to understand. In these words, though, the deepest understanding comes about. The identity and the purpose of Christ summed up in short phrases. You don't have to be a scholar. You just have to have your heart open and bring the faith in in those statements. By his life of love and sacrifice, we believe and sustain that he is the one who came and continues into a broken world to take our sins upon himself. He didn't just come one day and disappear. And I don't like, you know, I keep taking you back to the fact that we're stuck in time because we have to make free will choices. God is not stuck in time. He created time for us. We needed it. He doesn't need time. He created it for us. So we're, in effect, his, He's our liege, if you will. He is always, always sacrificing all the way across. We get, we have, if I've mentioned it so many times to you that it's, I know it's ad nauseum, but um, think of it, as I said before, think of it as our free will and our time as a whole bunch of bubbles on a table. And Christ is walking around that table. He doesn't, he's not in time. We are. And we make our decisions so that a lot of the young people say, well, how can he possibly know the end product? That's because he's not bound by what we're bound by. He can walk to the end of the table and see the end. He can go to the front of the table, see the beginning. And he can watch you making decisions throughout those little bubbles on the table. He is not bound by time. We are such dummies, aren't we? We can't perceive Someone outside of what his, he has created. And I won't go into it, but that's, I love that old as, aspect. I saw it the other day in one of the, one of the writings in the, in the 17th century. They were talking about understanding nothing. I thought, oh, I need to come talk to you. Because the only way we understand nothing is by no thing. We don't even understand nothing without by thinking about something. Nothing is something. We don't even know what nothing is. Just like we don't know what time is. So we have to be very careful in knowing that Christ is constantly dying for our sins. Every time we have sinned, He is sacrificing for each and every sin throughout our lives. Because He's not bound by time. He dies across the universe for us. Always. We should always give thanks. Always give thanks for Holy Scripture because it points us to this encounter with God. It is through the spiritual encounter that we learn and trust Him. In Scripture, as in life, God always comes to us as a loving, doesn't He? In Scripture, in the New Testament, a loving and life-sustaining experience. 
life-sustaining. The only time I've ever seen him terribly angry is in the temple. And he was turning over tables, which is, actually takes some strength. Those tables were not Walmart fold-up tables. They were heavily built tables meant to be stationary. That took a lot of strength for him to turn them over. Through his grace-filled experience, we're called to be partners and ambassadors to him, empowered to enrich the world. Enrich it. Isn't that not cool? That you, as an ambassador of Christ, are called to share your Christianity. You don't have to beat people over the head, oh, I'm Christian, and you're not. All you have to do is be Christian. People know what that is. They understand and perceive it. Actually, they're drawn to you because of that. And I know that you know people in this parish uh, that smile a little bit more than others. And I would venture a guess that you're probably drawn to those people in this parish that smile a little bit more than the rest of us. I don't smile that much. But there are some of us that do. And that becomes what? A draw because it is faithful. It basically says, I am with Christ. I trust him fully. Therefore, I trust you. The people that don't smile, you go, hmm, they don't trust anybody, so why should I trust them? It's, it's one of those kinds of things that Christianity just naturally provides to the world. Like the missionary call of the servant in Isaiah 49.1.3, and those called to be saints. I know I've said this so many times, you guys need to be in the book of saints. I think it'd be kind of a comedy book, but it would still be a book of saints, Right? You are all saints and called to be the same. In, in the first, Paul's first letter to the church in Corinthians, that's 1 Corinthians 2, we're informed that God's call is trustworthy and true. He would not call us to do things if we were not capable of doing them. Therefore, we can believe from the depth of our hearts that our God is always, 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 always faithful. Even in the worst depressions that I know you have had, every human being has them. Some much deeper than others, but we all experience them. The only thing that will save your soul is your love and faith in Christ. He's the only strength you have. Don't depend on your own, or you're going to crash and burn so fast. You have to depend on Him. Therefore, we can believe that God is faithful. And our faithful response to God is to rebuild broken lives. And that starts with yours. I, the, you know, the worst thing in the world is where Christians have bad things happen to them. So they think, oh, okay, I'm going to rush out and help other people. They don't need a broken person helping them. You need to take care of yourself first. The Baptists are right. Get right with God. Right? Get right with God, and then God will be right with you. That's a good Baptist saying. I, there was a, a Baptist minister who became an Anglican priest, and I loved to listen to his sermons. I was ready to stand up and go, Hallelujah! It was just, he was so good. Reconciling them to God's love and justice through Christ Jesus, the Lamb of our Lord. Through baptism into the body of Christ, we are energized and enabled by the Holy Spirit. You, you've got the Holy Spirit in your heart now. I don't know why people are searching for that. Well, they do that because they're rejecting the Holy Spirit. And when we reject the Holy Spirit, we are built to love and follow the Holy Spirit. And if you reject the Holy Spirit, what do you do? You end up trying to find something else to fill that hole. It could be government, it could be basketball, it could be something. Uh, none of it is fulfilling, though, is it? I always like the story of the richest guy in the world, fights his way to the top, gets to the top, and finds out there's nothing there. Lots of money, life is still empty. Lots of money. Life is still empty. It's a difficult understanding for us to get to. In other words, through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, we are called to inspire the human spirit with a sense of identity and purpose. You need to be strong as a Christian. We're not weak. I, you know, I've always had people, well, you know, it's, it's like that old thing. I'm going to take the, the leather straps and little things at the end, little knots at the end, and I'm just going to hit myself. Cause... No. That was wrong in the Middle Ages. It's wrong now. God doesn't want you to go around and beat yourself up. God wants you to understand that you are already His. You've already been forgiven. You don't have to lash your back to have that happen. But because you're forgiven, you should not be broken and you should help others who are. 
That is exactly the mission that we have. If you might remember, the aftermath of 9-11, to me, still is instructive. I still I have pictures of that, by the way, on my desk. In that horrific event, we saw God active in the world as God, as God was abused by the world. The tragedy opened our eyes to an aspect of God's encounter with humanity. This is to say that God is not to be limited to a personal package or personal perspective or a point of view. I'm sorry, but what you think God is, isn't. What you have to stop doing is putting God in a box. Don't put him in a box. I know what you're doing because I do it. It's a human trait, particularly in a Western Germanic-based culture. I know we have a lot of stuff mixed in with us, but part of our thinking is Hellenic and, and Germanic. And because we have that in our culture, we have bureaucracies, which is a very Germanic structure. And we put things in little boxes, don't we? Do you ever work in a bureaucracy? That's not my job. It's across the hall. Or did you ever go, well, they changed that a little bit, but years ago when you went to get your license, drive a car, oh, you talk to this lady first, and then you wait for two hours, and then you get your picture. She only does pictures. And then you sit for two more hours, and then you go over here, and then you have to fill out some more forms. I don't know if they, they probably cross-train, but during the day, this lady does A, this lady does B. This, that probably works pretty well. Bureaucracies are built to do that, to make sure there's efficiency. I'm not sure that's true, but that's what they're built for. You and I think the same way. I would suggest to you that you have to clear your head of who you think God is. Clear it out, because it's wrong. Just like nothing can ever be perceived by you or me, God can never be perceived boxed up like you or me. It's comfortable for us to do that, isn't it? God is like this, and I've got all of his traits, and I've got... No, you don't. God has you, and you're lucky that he has you, and you have no concept of who he really is, except that he is your creator, your savior, and he loves you deeply. Do you need to know anything else? If you had even one of those aspects of a mate, wouldn't that be great? Just the last one. Loves you deeply. What does that mean? Total sacrifice. Total openness. Total receptiveness. That's nice in a couple, I think. Husband and wife. It's nice even between children and parents. Although in teenage years that kind of changes a little bit. Until they get a little older. And they realize they can still come back to you and talk to you. Well, we also saw, pe saw people come together around the world. We saw people with many faith perspectives when that tragedy happened on 9-11, didn't we? That urgent crisis. God's love brought the terrible, terrible evil happening. And what happened? People came. People even sacrificed their own lives to try and save others. That's Christianity. Whatever the pathway to faith or religious tradition, God was there, alive and active. The right Reverend Michael B. Curry once said in a videotaped conversation, quote, If Jesus is lifted up as Lord, you don't have to pretend to be. Is that not a good statement? You have to be, actually, remember, the last will be first, the first will be last. If you have the Lord, don't be one of these terrible Christians. If, you're the, if you have the Lord, you're the servant. You help others. You have humility and sacrifice and grace. Too often in our enthusiasm for the Lord, and I hope you have that, we may unintentionally attempt to be the Lord instead of daily seeking Him. Well, I know what God wants, right? That's, that's called judgment. Now, discernment, we've talked about before. Discernment is different than judgment. You don't judge people. What does that mean? Remember? To judge people means that you damn them to hell or you say they should go to heaven. Mostly we do the first when we judge. Discernment is different. Discernment is, according to God's law, helping people understand what that law is. Not to send them to hell in judgment. Only God can do that. But by discerning, we can help them get to heaven, which is the one that God wants us to worry about. Discernment is a positive thing. Let us create space for God to speak of love and truth, justice and mercy. Our call for Christian discipleship and witness may well begin to flower 
when we ask ourselves just these few questions. One, who first, who first pointed Jesus out to me? Do you remember that? Many of you did it yourself. I remember as a child, um, two things I've shared with you before, but I remember when I was eight or nine and I was carrying a book on Jesus Christ and my, my mother walked me to the library and she was walking me back. At that time we were a Roman Catholic, or Polish National Catholic Church, Roman Catholic. And I said, I want to be a priest. And she said, over my dead body, I want grandchildren. So I became Anglican. But who did that? Did you do it yourself? Did someone give a spark to you? You know, that's important. If you go back to that one clear moment, you then know what caused the, the wonderful grace or spark of salvation that came to you from some other person, from a movie. It could be anything. But it's important to go back. Two, what developed and nourished you in your faith? I know most of us have a bumpy road, but we come back always. Three, when did I begin to share my faith, if ever, to proclaim Jesus as a Messiah, Lamb of God, and the Lord of my life? When did you do that, or have you? That's important. That's, if that's missing, we're still not there. And lastly, when was the last time I said to someone, you know, I found Jesus Christ. He's made my life worth living, and he will do the same for you if you choose to follow him. I wouldn't suggest you open a conversation at, in a coffee clutch with that, but if the conversation gets there, it's appropriate to share in some fashion. Being a disciple of Jesus means that we grow in faith. We're active, not passive. If nothing else, smile. Please. I'll ask that every time. Smile. You can't be a disciple of Jesus at a distance any more than you can love another person over a great distance. I've always seen, you ever see those movies where they finally break up because a long distant relationship just can't hold? See, a relationship is not a telephone call or what is it, WhatsApp? No, no, uh, face thing, whatever they do with the phones nowadays. Anyway, that's all well and good, but to, you know, holding an iPad is not like holding someone's hand or having them in front of you. You basically turn them into a piece of information which dehumanizes them. Whether you like it or not, that's what happens. So you can't love Jesus at a distance either. To love Christ is to be drawn close to him. Well, uh, I'll sit down and I'll read my morning prayer and I'm a good person. And I'll read evening prayer and I'm just as a good person. Meanwhile, I'm just going through the motion just to make sure that God knows that I'm carrying out my prayers. Uh, he could care less if you are not close to him. To help Christ is to share good news about him with others. There's a story of a professor who hated the Lord Jesus Christ. I've added this one in. I've used it once before, but he was so resentful. There are a lot of those around now. A lot of them. When I was in college, they were quiet. They're not so quiet anymore. He was so, by the way, they're in seminary now too. Would you believe? He was so resentful that he sharply criticized a young student for reading the New Testament. The young man responded by giving the professor a copy of the New Testament, asking him to read it himself then. That night, the professor alone in his room stayed up until the morning reading about the Nazarene who claimed to be the Messiah. By sunrise, the Holy Spirit had guided him to a new level in the light of revelation. He, quote, said this, I have found more than 200 passages of the New Testament that prove beyond a doubt that Jesus is truly the Messiah. If we could ever get our professors in our public universities to read scripture, most of them damn scripture and never read the first word of it, and that's unfortunate. There is truly, truly wonder-working power in the word of God. There's also miraculous power in sharing it. What we do for others means nothing when compared to what we can, what we do for ourselves, I'm sorry, means nothing compared to what we can do for others. Do you realize, finally, do you realize that just by your existing with other individuals that you can bring light to their darkness? Just by being with them. You don't have to hit them over the head with scripture, but just ask how they're doing. Do you know how many people would like to share how they're doing? They have it bottled up in themselves. By the way, when you do that, as Christians, 
Please throw out one of our Western traits. Please don't do it. Normally, Westerners don't listen. They're preparing their response. That's part of Western culture. I am not going to be taken down a peg by you. As a Christian, what we have to do is ask truly a question. Allow a person to respond and please don't say, Oh, I know what you mean because this happened to me. Who cares? Ask them a question. Listen as a Christian and simply allow them to open up. Do you realize that after that shell, which is what that is, dissolves, you now have a view of their heart. That shell is before you. They have to tell you these things first to dissolve that shell. If you let them do that, you now have their heart. At that point, they simply want you to love them. What I mean by that is Christian love. Simply to love them, to be attentive, and to be non-judgmental. I don't care what you hear. Discernment is always good, but there are certain situations where you might want to say it right away. Let the time mature and let it occur easily. Love on the road where hate once traveled. You and I don't like somebody, don't we? Maybe lots of somebodies. Maybe some political parties. Maybe all kinds of things. I won't use Aunt Gertrude. Um, Aunt, Aunt Mabel. Whomever it might be. We have to change that. Because if you still harbor that, you have the shell. No one's going to express anything to you until yours dissolves. You have to get rid of that shell. And hope to the house where hopelessness once lived. When I say hopelessness, I mean just giving people the support they need. You don't have to give them money. You don't have to give them anything. Give them Christ. What does that mean? Your smile, your support. Do you know what you can do with just being present? All of those things. You bring hope to hopeless situations. You allow expression so that people finally open their heart to anybody, not just you. And you bring the opportunity for them to understand that there are real human beings who are Christians and that Christianity is a caring religion. Blessed are we when we bring to others the gift of love and peace and justice, tolerance, that's a tough one, and mercy. And finally, blessed are we when we do so by becoming a witness to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. You are made in the image of God. Act like it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.